In this last lecture, we are going to discuss concepts related to the nature of general anaesthesia. First, we will define general anaesthesia. Next, we will discuss the term depth of anaesthesia. And then we will review the stages of anaesthesia as described by Goodell. You may find that it is quite possible to witness hundreds of anaesthetics only to learn that you are incapable of defining general anaesthesia in a concise manner. This was an experience I had in my first year as a trainee. In fact, this topic has been subject to an enormous amount of debate and consensus opinion has changed many times. Presently, general anaesthesia is believed to comprise unrousable unconsciousness and depression of reflexes, where those reflexes are somatic, autonomic and neuroendocrine. Analgesia is considered a distinct phenomenon. Amnesia is discarded because it is implied by unconsciousness. And relaxation is discarded because it is possible to maintain a mobility without paralysis and because suppression of somatic reflexes can be placed under the umbrella of reflex suppression in general. As a side note, keep in mind that amnesia is not actually a single phenomenon either. It is believed that benzodiazepines prevent formation of explicit memories much more so than implicit memories. This means that if a toddler is pre-medicated with midazolam and suffers through an unpleasant inhalational induction, he might flip out when he is wheeled into the induction room a month later without knowing why. This diet of narcosis and reflex depression has given rise to the idea that these phenomena represent two axes on a Cartesian plane of anesthesia. General anaesthetic drugs tend to cause a good deal of narcosis, but less reflex suppression. Opioids tend to do the opposite, and so propofol and remifentanil is a match made in heaven. Note that the intraoperative function of opioids is reflex suppression. Their analgesic effect only becomes important upon, upon emergence. I think this is a useful way to think about anesthesia, and it is reflected in entropy monitoring. State entropy incorporates the EEG monitor only. Response entropy also incorporates frontalis muscle EMG data, increased activity of which is associated with nociception. Therefore, if there is a major discrepancy between state entropy and response entropy, then the answer might be more opioid rather than more general anesthetic agent. That's the theory anyway. The only problem with this representation is that it suggests an additive interaction between hypnotics and opioids, and we know from the previous lecture that this is not even close to the truth. We will now examine the term depth of anesthesia. Although one might have an intuitive understanding of this term as the physiological correlates of a given concentration of general anesthetic agent, the very idea of anesthetic depth is disputed by many learned anesthetists. The reasons for this are as follows. Firstly, as we have seen, Anesthesia is not a unidimensional entity. And secondly, both consciousness and reflex arcs are quantal phenomena rather than existing on continua. They are either present or they are not. Having said that, once consciousness is present, there are clearly gradations which we see reflected in the Glasgow Coma Scale and the Richmond Sedation Scale. Likewise, once a reflex arc is present, that activity exists on a continuum as well. One patient might wiggle a toe upon surgical incision, whereas another might jump off the table. Whether you use this much maligned term or not depends upon your worldview. When a surgeon seeks permission to start an operation, you can say, no, sorry, the patient is not deep enough. Or you can say, the partial pressure of anesthetic agents in the effect site at the present time is insufficient to achieve our desired physiological endpoints. Or you can take my approach and sidestep this linguistic problem by saying, give me 30 seconds. In reality, there are a large number of things in medicine we say which are technically wrong, but still convey the intended meaning. Again, whether this is important depends upon the way you see the world. The term depth of anesthesia is partly a legacy of Arthur Goodell, a wartime surgeon who described four distinct stages of inhalational anesthesia. He observed changes in respiratory rate and amplitude, airway reflexes, muscle tone, pupil size, ocular movements and lacrimation that occurred in a predictable fashion during inhalational induction and therefore likely corresponded to anesthetic concentration. 
Note that while Goodell's description pertains to inhalational anesthesia, we also see these stages in attenuated form during intravenous anesthesia using propofol, which, like the volatiles, exerts its effects mainly at the GABA-A receptor. Stage number one is named analgesia. I tend to think of it as sedation, both because that is what we observe and because inhalational anesthetic drugs are known not to be analgesic. The second stage is called excitement. We might also think of it as disinhibition. This is the point at which the patient becomes unconscious during inhalational induction. Here, there is tachycardia, tachypnea, involuntary movement of the trunk and limbs, and most notably, dilated and divergent pupils. During this stage, the patient is at highest risk of all manner of airway complications, including coughing, laryngospasm, bronchospasm, breath holding, vomiting, and aspiration. The third stage is called surgical anesthesia. It is further divided into four planes during which protective reflexes are progressively lost. The fourth stage is called respiratory paralysis. I think of this as paralysis of the brainstem in general, where both the respiratory and cardiovascular systems are being shut down and we see the dilated pupils of death. It's not necessary to have memorized Goodell's observations, I certainly never did, but it's useful to understand each stage conceptually and to know the eye signs associated with each of them. Specifically, dilated and divergent pupils are pathognomonic for the stage of excitation, and as we discussed before, this is the point at which airway complications are most likely to occur. If the eyes are googly when you are about to insert an LMA, it is necessary to give more propofol. If the eyes are googly at extubation, it is important to wait a little longer. I find that the eye signs are more reliable in this regard than any objective monitor that money can buy. Of course, these discussions seem heretical given that we have just debunked the concept of depth of anesthesia. However, if you dare to extubate an obese five-year-old tonsillectomy patient whose eyes are in the back of his head, you will find it very hard to convince yourself that Arthur Goodell's description counts for nothing. Therefore, Goodell's stages might be said to be true in the sense that they have functional utility. As for how we might reconcile these conflicting theories of general anesthesia, I would say this. General anesthesia as a concept consists of quantal phenomena. General anesthetics as drugs are present in concentrations that vary along a continuum. As we progress along that continuum, we see dose-dependent sedation, then transient excitatory phenomena upon loss of consciousness, then dose-dependent inhibition. As an aside note, it is interesting that we see excitation followed by inhibition during both sodium channel mediated local anesthetic toxicity and GABAergic general anesthesia. One wonders whether preferential suppression of inhibitory interneuronal activity is a common mechanism. In summary, the take home message for the exams is that general anesthesia equals unrousable unconsciousness plus reflex depression. The take home message for practice is to stay away from the airway when the eyes are googly. Thank you for listening. I hope this little series was helpful to you.